May you live as long as you want, but never want as long yeah. as you live, baby. While living in a world of freedom, because intelligence is uh, so expensive. Welcome to The Real Men Show. I'm your host, Bobby Glanton Smith. We're going to look at life and issues that impact the quality of your day to day. Our goal is to raise the consciousness and inspire positive social and economic change. Thanks for watching and enjoy the ride. Rather than wounded herders, we need words of encouragement, words of gentleness, words of kindness, words of ennoblement. Yeah, we want. Welcome to the Real Men Show. I have with me today uh, a young man by the name of Thomas Pierce. Um, Thomas, you're 29 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you're a film student at where? Golden West College. Golden West College. And you grew up in this area. Yeah, Orange County. Yeah. Coastal Born and raised, raised yeah. whatever. And uh, as we were talking earlier, I spent a little time with you on, uh, on some other occasions, uh, helping with the production of the uh, Real Men documentary. And uh, I got a couple of questions I want to ask you in, in black and white. Uh, I found out something today that I didn't know. You have mixed ancestry. So kind of get into uh, your your makeup uh, from that standpoint, your genetic makeup. Yeah, I got a uh, father that's about uh, 57 years old right now. He's uh, from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, he's uh, you know born and raised there. He's uh, Polish Irish, mainly Polish. Um, and I have a mother that is uh, from you know native Calif Southern California. Uh, she is uh, full-blooded Mexican, and uh, after my dad served uh, in the United States Marine Corps down here in Pendleton, uh, they met, had a couple children, and never left. Mm. Now, I asked you earlier off camera about your ancestry and what you put on a, an application when they uh, raised the question of your ethnicity or your nationality, and you said that you were... Yeah, I, Personally, don't like to answer those questions, but if I have to, absolutely have to, I'd put down uh, Hispanic, honestly. Now, why don't you like or dislike answering that question? For one, I, I believe it's nobody's business, honestly, whether um, I'm black, uh, Indian, uh, Pacific Islander, I don't think it really makes a difference. I only think it makes a difference when you know what you're doing and what you're applying for, and you can do the job the best of your abilities and can do. Now, how did you arrive at that opinion? Well, honestly, I don't think that, you know, those questions should even be asked on an application. I mean, what are they intended for? Other than just, you know, finding out a little bit about the person, what they look like, what they, you know, some kind of background, maybe traditional background, maybe, a, you know, maybe a completely wild background, but Still, I don't think it should matter. It should only matter the general questions of, you know, education, where you've been, your experiences and stuff like that relating to the job at hand. How do you formulate most of your opinions? Uh, do you do it through reading, um, television, music? What, 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 what shapes your worldview? Mainly observations, you know, on a day to day basis, you know, dealing with uh, people, you know, going here, going there, doing this, doing that. You know, I'm, I, kind of find myself a pretty open person to you know just everybody you know when I observe other people and some of the mistakes that they do wrong I try to learn from other people's mistakes but you know I've made my share fair share of mistakes as well what are your news sources probably just the internet you know uh, what 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 sites on the internet do you I uh, you know get knowledge uh, from if Orange sure. County Register LA Times um, Pretty much, you know. You do you? Uh, I barely watch go to any the, TV. So. Okay, but you go to the, the the internet and on a regular basis, like every day, once yeah, a week. Yeah, yeah. Film student, you know, you're always on there. You know, latest, greatest stuff and everything else like that. So. Okay. Now, we just had a uh, a very tragic reminder of the racial divide in this country, uh, with the the uh, killing, and in some of our estimation, the murdering of a young black man down in uh, Orlando, Florida by the name of Trayvon Martin. What were your perceptions and reactions to that sequence of events? 
you know, if there's, you know, I wasn't there personally or anything like that, but, you know, if it, this country is founded on, uh, you know, a jury of peers, you know, and you've got a jury of peers that can't find right or wrong with a situation, you know, there is no real hard evidence to really put a man to death or put him in jail for life, then you can't prosecute the man, honestly. Okay, when you say you can't prosecute someone, um, well, they tried. Okay, that's what I'm asking you. What, did you think that was a just uh, verdict? No. Why? Because an innocent life was taken. Whether innocent or guilty, it, you know, however that played out, whatever, but I don't think that somebody that shoots somebody else should go to jail. I mean, they should go to jail, but not for a lifetime. You know, whether it was justified or not, who knows? No, but, we do know. In some people's eyes, well, it depends on, that's why I'm asking the question. In, in circles that you move in, how did people uh, perceive that? Did they figure that was a fair and just verdict? Or did they feel that uh, justice wasn't served? Well, a lot of people that I associate myself with, they couldn't make heads or tails of it either. You know, there are just so many factors to be considered in that like situation. What? You know, the uh, testimony of his girlfriend, the last conversation that he had, um, you know, uh, some of the other witnesses that were around the area and heard the gunshots, you know, they don't, nobody actually knew other than um, Trayvon and, uh, what was his name? George Zimmerman. Zimmerman. Now, we're from different age groups. I'm older than your dad, matter of fact. And as I sit here with you, honestly, I see that we we formulate opinions uh, differently, and a lot of it has to do with historical things that have happened in, in my lifetime that you weren't around for. And I'll go back to the question of privilege. Is it possible that because you grew up, is it because you grew up in a different era, or did, it, did you grow up in a, in a situation where when I look at you, I can see a couple of features that I'm familiar with, your nose, for example, or, you know, and some of your, your outward features, mm -hmm. but your hair and your complexion, you can pass for white. Uh, and I, I'm asking, could you possibly take into account that I would feel that you are overlooking the option of white privilege? Is that possible? I believe that uh, privilege is there, yeah. And give me a couple of examples of how that privilege would would play out in your day-to-day -day life? Well, it hasn't happened for me yet, but uh, anybody with a decent educational background can easily get a job, no problem, especially with the older folks, older white folks up in the, you know, fat cat office, you know, deciding the hiring and firing of a lot of people and everything. They really generally run a lot of things, and they're from an older generation as well, and they have their preference. And if I, eventually they're gonna be leaving the office um, and then a new generation will be taken over and I think at that point I don't think it's really gonna matter race at that point. Well, as far as work is, work goes. Work goes. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of controversy recently about the use of the word nigger. In your era, what does that word conjure up in your mind and in your perception of the word when you hear it and how it's used? Well, in my era it's basically somebody who wants to or doesn't want to or it's like a lower form of a certain race type just like uh, how there are white trash people there are wet backs there are you know uh, zipper heads in the Asian community or whatnot but in my eyes I'm not gonna be speaking for my entire generation but because some of them are still ignorant you know what percentage in your opinion? Uh, a very small percentage that have the family 5%, ties. 5%, 10%? I'd say about 5% of my generation, I would mm -hmm. say, that are still being raised and taught that that is, you know, oh, look at that one person. That's, that's you know, the N-word or that's just, you know, a white trash person or something like that. You know, it's not, it all, like, you know, going back to family histories and stuff like that, being raised and what you're taught and everything. That's that still five percent that exists, mm -hmm. you know. But for the remainder, and I would say general overall of my era, would say that, you know, it would be 
a derogatory term for somebody that does not contribute to the greater good of society and the greater good of themselves to prosper over their previous ancestries. Have you ever used the word nigga? And I'm going to use it because it's used. And until we stop using it uh, across the board, it's there. And there's no sense in me trying to just shorten it up with the N-word, but that's what it is, okay? I use it differently than you use it. Mm -hmm. And I'm more conscious of that now because I've been around uh, uh, people that I'm comfortable with who happen to be white, and, I, and uh, I'll speak in my native tongue, and I'll use it. And not, sometimes I'm, I'm more conscious now and more sensitive because I need them to understand that there are limitations to, to that. And that's where it gets to be really uh, a, a contradictory and controversial subject matter. Have you ever used the word, and how did you use it? I have uh, once or twice, and I've lost a really, really good friend because of it. And uh, in the context, I used it with uh, one of my friends before because he was generally just, you know, uh, an addict, grew up in a bad home, but didn't want to perspire to what his potential could have been in life. And you know what? I can't say that I've known anything else that he's been doing with his life so far. But as soon as I used that, I wanted to snap him out of his current funk that he was in so he could continue going to school and giving himself the education that is required in this world to succeed. So how did he react when you called him a nigga? Completely pissed off. But, you know, I'm, if it took that just to shake him out of his little groove or whatever he was in, I'd happy to do it. But did he, did he shake out of it? I don't know. I still don't yeah. talk to him. Jim Brown, Houston. Jimmy Guilford, Dale Hurd, Mike Ladd, Sam Watson, JT the Bright, Rockhead Johnson, and Real Men Don't Play. The truth is, I laugh and joke, but I don't play. Welcome back to the Real Men Show. I'm sitting here with Mr. Thomas Pierce. Um, so, Thomas, how big a factor is race? in your generation man. it's not really a big factor at all now when you say it's not a big factor we just had the Trayvon Martin case okay there's another case that's going to come uh, into the public eye next month down in Florida both of those cases in Florida um, we have black and brown conflict here in California that's really problematic so are you sure that race is no longer a factor for real? Well, I would say in the Orange County area, yeah, that's more, this is a generally like a Republican kind of county right here. Mm -hmm. You know, everywhere else, uh, you know, L.A., I mean, San Diego, that you hear about it, all of these gang problems and everything like that, too. Uh, in Orange County, I honestly, you know, and it is a little bubble. It is a self-secluded little bubble. Okay. Yeah. And, you know. The friends and everything else like that that I've been growing up with in Orange County all my life, you know, honestly, race was not an issue at all. Basically, educational standpoint, and they are coming from privileged families, you know, a lot of money in their bank accounts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you mentioned education. Um, how much education should a person have before they actually go to work? I mean, should people be encouraged to? go straight from high school to college, or should there be a, an apprenticeship in between, uh, uh, at least a, 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 a break from school for a minute till you make a decision on what you want to do in life? I believe that, uh, you know, this day and age, you can't survive out in the real world without a, a good college education. A college education? Yes. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Why do you feel that way? Because everybody's getting them. Everybody you know, else is getting, getting They're going to pick somebody with a college education over somebody that doesn't. You might be surprised to know that um, people with college educations now are getting paid less than they got paid 20 years ago. Absolutely. So you still subscribe to the notion that college is the, the route to go if you want to live above the poverty line? Absolutely. Why did you feel that way? Because I'm below that poverty line. Because of a lack of a, a college degree? Yeah, I'm almost 30 and I don't even have an associate's under my belt. And you are an aspiring filmmaker? Yes, I'm 
slowly but surely trying to work my way up to a college education while I continue to work to make ends meet. Okay, but you didn't answer the question directly. You want to be a filmmaker, Yes. Right? Now, is that a prerequisite, a college degree to begin becoming a successful filmmaker? I would agree with that, yes. Why? Did George Lucas graduate from college? No, neither did uh, Steven Spielberg. So that's why I'm asking the question one more time. Is the notion of getting a college degree clearly connected to being successful in a specific profession? In this I'd have to say in this industry, no, because it takes just one great idea to make something actually work. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't think it matters, you know, what industry it is. You know, you could be an inventor, you could be a grant writer, you could be a, a mechanic, you could be anything, just the next greatest and latest idea for that industry to actually thrive. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be something small, okay. you know, but I do believe since I want to be a uh, you know a film editor or whatnot, college education would definitely put me tops above everybody else because I have to keep updated with the newer technology and that's changing constantly. And uh, learning some of the old techniques and the way things started and how they developed to today's life, you know, and how things are done this day and age. What's going to be the next big thing in terms of economic opportunities? What what was, what industry or what segment of our economy is going to provide the most opportunity for somebody to live above the poverty line? In your opinion, that's a damn good question. Okay, I have Do you no have, idea. Okay, uh, what's what's your feelings about global warming, for example? Is it is it a, a myth or is it real? You know, it's. I don't believe that it's a myth because all the fossil fuel and everything else like that that we're burning up it's not escaping out of the atmosphere mm -hmm. you know what i mean the ozone layer is keeping all that stuff in and you know what it's going to be trapped and eventually it's going to come down low enough to affect us so does that allow you to form uh, an intelligent opinion the answer you just gave me on which direction we, we should be going should we going should we be going in the direction of wind and sun uh, should we continue to dig into the uh, into the earth to extract oil for our energy No, source? I think we can do well enough with uh, wind and sun and more technology that's coming out. It's changing by the minute. You know, we can formulate something within the next five, ten years that can give us enough power to last us for, you know, a good three years of the world's consumption right now. Okay. Now, what factor is most prevalent in your life experience that relates to the health crisis that we're experiencing in the nation because a lot of people in your age group are sicker, fatter, lethargic, and uh, dependent on medication than in, in, at any point in my lifetime. What do you attribute that to? I attribute that to uh, society and stresses of society, you know what I mean? That's, Stress triggers a lot of dormant, you know, diseases or whatnot that, you know, my generation is suffering from. And, you know, lack of, uh, like I said, like, you know, education, work, uh, the political crap that's been going on in the White House, you know, it's just nobody knows, you know, from my generation of where we actually fit into the puzzle. There's a lot of people that are out there that are still, you know, running corporate America that are not retiring because they can't so much so much money it takes just to survive and continue to live in you know America that you know the older folks can't quit their jobs younger people are suffering because the older folks are not leaving their jobs and the younger people cannot get in jobs now let's narrow that down to and a lot of it's going to be like a lot of the health professional, uh, the nursing industry is, is flourishing. You know, if you got that credential, yeah. not necessarily a college degree with that credential, you can make a above the poverty line uh, wage. Um, how big a factor is television and marketing and advertising? How much does that contribute to people being as sick as they are in your age group? 
probably daily constant reminders of people that are just sitting on the couch doing absolutely nothing with their lives. Okay, beyond that, what they putting in their mouth, what they're drinking, what they're eating, what, what, what factor does that play in the rising number of sick Americans, young Americans who are on medication? Constantly on the go trying to make something of themselves. At okay. least a little bit. The small percentage that I actually do, uh, I'm constantly on the go. I barely have any time to eat a good home-cooked meal that I can control what kind of ingredients go into my food so I know what I'm actually eating. Uh, you know, most of the time, you know, college students, you know, they work jobs. They work sometimes two jobs and go to school full-time just to make it. Do you drink sodas? Not anymore. I used to. How long has it been since you had a soda? For about a year. About a year. And you uh, you got some medical challenges. What are they? Oh, I'm a diabetic. I have been for about four, no, for about six, seven years now. And what do you attribute that to? Bad diet, honestly. And what were some of the things that you grew up eating? Oh, you know, my mother was Mexican. She made a lot of Mexican food and Mexican candy. Uh, you know, even sometimes my old man would cook, you know, it'd be Polish food and uh, what buttered noodles and casseroles and stuff like that. It was just a lot of carbohydrates that went into my diet and not a lot of exercise. So do you eat uh, much live food? By that I mean food that just came right out of the ground. Green leafy vegetables on a daily basis. It's never a factor. What about now? Now it's the cornerstone of my entire uh, diet. I eat a lot of green vegetables. Okay. Now, what are you consuming in terms of uh, water or uh, liquid products? A lot of teas, uh, you know, uh, organic teas. You know, I can make it home. I can uh, chill it at home, bring it along with me with a canteen or, you know, even, even like a, a dietary staple or something like that. You know, at least it's better than any kind of soda that chemicals that they put in there. Do you uh, understand the difference between alkalinity and acidity? health and wellness I understand just a little bit of it do you think it would be advantageous to know more about the distinction about the foods that produce it, the food and beverages that produce acid and the foods and beverages that produces alkalinity and the difference between the two well, I think it'd be very beneficial okay okay but well, we'll be right back after this short break hi I'm Bobby Glanton Smith, the author of Real Men Don't Play. Time changes everything except car tires, baby diapers, and the makeup and composition of real men. This book is dedicated to the legacy, the spirit, and the tradition of manhood. Some of these men are famous. Some of these men are infamous. They have one thing in common. They live by a code. They say what they mean, and they mean what they say. This book will allow you, as a reader, to meet and understand and appreciate the walk and the journey of some of these great men. Real men don't play. Enjoy the ride. I'm back with Thomas Pierce. Got a couple more questions before we wrap up this uh, maiden voyage of the Real Men Show. And I appreciate you taking some time away from your schedule to sit with me and, and kind of, you know, just allow me to learn more about the younger people that are in a position where you guys got to step in as we step off and that transition has been real rocky, okay? Um, I just asked you off camera um, your, your, your current living status and you told me that you're, you're working, you're going to school and you're back at home. Um, what percentage of your circle of friends are living independent of their parents right now? A very small percentage, I'd say uh, maybe 3%. 3%? 3%. The reason I say that, see, back uh, in my era, by the time you turned 18, you was either off to college, the military, the penitentiary, or the graveyard. But the one place you weren't is at home. It was almost mandatory. You had to leave the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. What has happened in the last 40 years that has created this situation where it's almost completely reversed and kids are staying at home late into their 20s and their early 30s? I'd say it's the uh, definitely the uh, stiff competition that's out there to get yourself a good independent job and uh, lack of space to actually move out on your own. When you say lack of space, what do you mean? 
Oh man, uh, California is very well known for being spread out, not building up apartment buildings and such forth. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, getting a good space for yourself is, you know, in suburban Orange County would be like uh, Irvine or something like that, or you know, houses. Mm -hmm. You know, mainly a lot of people around here want houses, and they got the money to make them. You know, mm -hmm. make the money to uh, get an actual house. Mm -hmm. And you know, small apartments and stuff like that these days are so cramped and so overpriced that you know, somebody, one person alone with a college education, not living at home, you know, maybe getting kicked out at eighteen or whatever the case may be, wouldn't even be able to sustain himself, anyways. Okay. Now, what role does music play in the mind and the makeup of people in your age group? Only popularity. Excuse me? Only popularity. When you say popularity, I need you to be more specific. Uh, you know, whether five or ten of your friends are listening to different songs. Okay, here's where I'm going with that question. Um, from what I can hear now, the music is, is fatalistic, misogynistic. Uh, it it basically it says, hey, it doesn't really matter. I don't give a damn. You know, it's just whatever. Uh, from my vantage point, it's very impactful in the behavior of young people. Their indifference to uh, other people, uh, their irreverence, you know, the disrespect has become, you know, the norm. Mm -hmm. And as a younger person, I'm asking you, can you even perceive that being a problem as it relates to being self-reliant, uh, ambitious, goal-oriented, and more humane? Is that possible, that music affects a person's ability to punch those tickets to that just missed. I don't think it's really the music. I think it takes an intelligent mind to, you know, conjure up being a good person just for humanity's sake, you know. Uh, I personally don't feel like music has any kind of effect on the, the younger generation because the younger generation, uh, I honestly believe that they overthink a lot of situations, you know. They think a lot more than they do. And that's that's the one of the other factors that contributed to the health, you know. Uh, stress and everything. Um, just being a good general person has no effect on what kind of music or what kind of music they listen to affect their kind of overlook on humanity. Or I honestly believe it's just, you know, how you're raised, what type of people you're raised around, and who your friends are and who you generally associate yourself with. Um, I would beg to differ. But I, I, I wanted to ask that question because I need to get inside that a little more. Um, because they don't do drive-bys to love song. They do drive-bys to gangster rap. I, uh, I would imagine the young kid that, uh, that did the Columbine thing was listening to some probably heavy metal, you know. Uh, I'm more of the opinion that music does matter because if you're constantly listening to things, Whatever it is, if you just bombarded with those messages, whatever they are, they tend to affect your behavior. Is that possible? I generally don't agree with that. What kind of music you listen to? All kinds. For example? Oh, hell. Um, you dig some Marley? I love Bob Marley. I love Al Green. I love uh, Led Zeppelin. I love... For the people that you just said that you love, those are your generation. Yes, Not only I that, they, the message, you know, those were people who uh, inspired you with their music. Absolutely. Okay. And if you would have mentioned Marilyn Manson or some of these other people that I don't even really know the name of, I would have had a different opinion about you saying music doesn't matter. Okay. Because like I said, you... you, you well, don't knock out the fact that I still listen to like maybe a one hit wonder band at this, this day and age. But I, that's I, I can it. allow that, you know, yeah, yeah. but there's a foundation though yeah. that you have built your, your worldview on that does include music from genres that precede you in age. Oh, absolutely. Okay, and that was the reason that I asked that. Um, my final question to you is this. If you were president of the United States 
for a month, what would be job one, job two, job three, job four in your presidency? What would be the four major things that you would want to accomplish if you had a month to do it? First things first, I would uh, give people back their freedoms. You know, as far as, uh, you know, small petty laws are concerned, you know, as far as, uh, you know, helmet laws and jaywalking ticket laws and, you know, just small things like that. I'd give people back the freedom to actually think for themselves again instead of having rules and regulations and all this stuff being shoved down their throats. Okay, that's one. Yeah, number two. Would, would that be number one? That would be number one. I think people are more angry these days and age, this day and age, because they're being so oppressed by the government and stupid petty laws. Okay, what would be number two? Number two, I definitely get back everybody. I would try to get back the people, the working man, back their jobs. Everybody needs to work. How? What would what would be your policies that would encourage employers or uh, angel investors, venture capital to? employ people as opposed to sh shredding drives, which seems to be the case now. What would you do um, as the president to make that happen? You know, I'd, I'd probably try to just work on getting jobs back in the United States. How? That's a good question. You know, it's all checks and balances, but I would uh, definitely start, uh, you know, taxing big, company, big corporations more money. I uh, would definitely raise minimum wage, and in the long term, I don't know if that's going to be very effective or not, but that's just a general start, just to bring businesses back. Why would jobs be sucking and your first priority be first, which was the, the menial thing that did annoy you? Why would that not be reversed? Honestly, the uh, I think people are just... As a society, I feel like a general population of people are getting so frustrated with how much small pity crap is actually going on and the government's overlooking the big picture of people getting to back to work. Okay, what would be third? Third, you know, that's, I'd definitely redo the education system. How, however. I don't have a plan or anything like that, but... But then let's move on to number four. Everything just needs to be Did you get a plan, I don't want you sitting up here pontificate. Yeah. But get one, because you got a good mind. And we need your input on that, because that's critical. You're going through some stuff right now. Absolutely. That you can speak first person about, in terms of the frustration, the roadblocks. It costs too much money. It take, you know, it's hard to get classes. It's a whole lot of things that they're doing. And that you can speak to absolutely that have kept you from being able to finish your, your education. What would be four? That's a good question. I don't know. Mm. That's, that's your homework then. Yeah, know? that's my homework. Um, as we close out this interview, one of the reasons that I, I was glad to take this opportunity to get with, with, uh, with Thomas, uh, he has contributed uh, significantly to the real men uh, documentary that we were working on. And I, yes, I, I, I got to give some dap on that, man. I appreciate your help Thank on you. that. Thank um, you. We've got to close that gap generationally. I've got to be a little more uh, understanding about how we got to a point where I see the world one way and you see it another. And we got to close that gap because you got to be able to answer these questions that I asked you. Your generation has got to be able to answer these questions. And some of it comes from this kind of interaction. Yep. As opposed to me standing over and saying, what's wrong with these cats? You know, and then y'all looking at like, oh, they done got too old to tell us anything. We do have to close that gap. And um, I want to thank you for just sitting here and, and, and sitting under that hot light for a minute and, and exposing your views and then allowing me to interact with you in that kind of a way. And as we go forward with these podcasts, we want to deal with real life, real situations that affect us, each and every one of us. 24-7 and as a result of this interaction come up with some solutions some ideas that we can turn into policies that affect the social and economic landscape in a, in a very progressive and sustainable way thomas thanks a lot completely agree with you thank okay, you sir we out of here